Hello there, and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga, and this is episode number 384. That's 384 of the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. If it's your first time tuning into the show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave a comment down below. If you're listening to the show via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review, download the show, share it to your friends, put it on the back of a postcard, send it via SMS, chuck it out of your window so your friend can catch it whilst they're running past your house on the morning run, they bump into somebody, it falls out their pocket, drops into a drain, and then passes through the, the drainage system of London and ends up in some child's hand somewhere across the, the British Isles. That would be great. But apart from that, you can also support the show via Patreon. The link is down below to patreon.com for slash Agostino. That's patreon.com for slash Agostino, A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. For as little as one pound per month, you can get access to my entire library as well as this show in audio format before it comes out everywhere else. So make sure you check that out. Anyway, how are you guys doing? How are you guys feeling? Great, man. Um, <clears throat> I'm still hanging on in there, man. Still hanging on in there, training a bunch. I'm actually gonna I'm recording this now and then gonna go out for a run. So that's been going pretty well, as I can tell. I've been getting nice and swole, you know. Um, do me old sixteen hour plus fasting, which has been pretty excellent for the most part, and just living that sober October life. I actually need to get a little list of things I'm gonna do during this month, actually, that I want to kind of write down and put into, you know, just put it into the reefer, put it out there so that. I can hold myself accountable in some sort of um, digital way. So look out for that coming very, very soon. But it's going to be the basics, you know, of course, abstaining from all the, you know, um, all the vices that exist out there, the drinking, the drug taking, all that malarkey, but then also upping some other stuff that I want to do in terms of reading, watching movies, writing a bunch, um, loads on my list that I'm kind of going to get through, but I'm going to try and get it as um, precise as I can, you know, the more precise the more exact you get with your goals the easier they are to reach in my experience so if i do if i break them down into some sort of succinct list present them or yeah succinct list read them out aloud read them aloud present them on the podcast of course i'm going to hold myself accountable and then we can carry on going that way anyway got a gem pack show for you today loads of stuff to get through let's not waste any more time and let's just dive right on in First bit of news to get through and distressing for myself, being a Manchester United fan, the transfer window is now closed, right? The transfer window came to a grinding halt yesterday, what, evening at about 11pm, all transfers um, pertaining to teams within the European leagues had to be concluded at 11pm Monday. And um, yeah, United, um, at the beginning of the window, probably needed four players especially off the back of the then fast forward off the back of the Tottenham loss so you would say we probably needed six so it was paramount that we filled in some positions such as right wing such as center midfield such as striker but then considering that the collapse that we faced in front of Tottenham you would have assumed that our coaching staff would have thought it would paramount to sign a centre-back or two in order to provide the cover or the competition needed in order for us to have a some sort of solid uh, defence or some sort of defence that was capable of withstanding some you know constant attacks from the opposition side but unfortunately that didn't happen instead what we were presented from the Matty Night hierarchy was the signings of Edson Cavani, Alex Tellez, Facundo Pelestiri and Amar Diallo. Now, if you're not a fan of football, you might say to yourself, hey, Casino, why are you complaining? Th- those are all names of players that are pretty good, aren't they? Yes, but when you get into the details, it makes it very distressing. Well, number one, Edison Cavani here, the first player, has been with our club for eight months or eight to seven months. He's been a free agent. He's released from Paris Saint-Germain, the club here that he's wearing the jersey of. And since then, he hasn't played football. He hasn't kicked a ball in eight months. Yes, he's been keeping himself fit, you know, doing a bit of ballet, horseback riding, whatever Argentinians do. Great. But he hasn't been playing football for eight months. Plus, he's 33 years old. We're not signing one of the premier strikers at these pumps, which would have been, what, 2016, 2017 season. We're signing a striker who is pretty past his best, who a striker that they didn't want to keep a hold at PSG, a striker who they would have rather, imagine, think about this, PSG wanted, would rather let go of Edison Cavani and sign Chipper Moteng and Mario Icardi instead of this guy right and you would you would think to yourself even a half fit even a half firing um edson cavani is a far better option than picking chipper moteng or mario cardi but no they still persisted with picking those two players instead of edson cavani so warning signs there 
Alex Tellez, a, a left back we've needed since the beginning of the window. I've not got no complaints about him. Um, Porto's captain, 27 years old, um, extremely experienced. He's played hundreds of games, many assists, many goals. He's got more assists and more goals than Luke Shaw could ever dream of having. I think Luke Shaw's current stats are like seven assists over seven years. Alex Tellez has, you know, near on double digits um, assists only in the season just gone. And I think this season he's got a couple already underneath his belt. So, you know, we're getting a brilliant player there. The only problem I'd have with it is maybe him bring Brazilian. Brazilians usually don't Brazilians sometimes are a bit hit and miss in terms of settling in the UK but the fact that we've got Fred uh, playing here and we've got obviously Fernandino playing on the other side for Man City I'm pretty sure he'll be fine in terms of settling down then you move on to this kid here Facundo Pelestiri some 18 year old kid we bought from Uruguay who I'm assuming we bought as a backhand um what favor to whoever organized the Edson Cavani deal because I don't understand why we'd pick him um he looking from the highlights I've seen online he looks pretty terrible um for the most part he, he looks no better than the players that we already have in our academy or the players that we have already let go to go on loan most notably what's his face has gone to Wolfsburg and then secondly or lastly we've got the most exciting signing unfortunately who's only going to join us in January Amadou Diallo um, 18 year old winger who plays at Atalanta at the moment from uh, Ivory Coast he looks incredible in the highlights he actually looks like he's got something about him um, he's been spoken about very highly um, within the Atalanta ranks they've got a great youth system there but I say he's one of their best um, exports from that um, youth system that they've got set up there but again because of work um, permit stipulations he's only able to join us in January and we spent guess what 38 million on this kid too or 37 and a half something along those lines <clears throat> which makes you your brain hurt because you think to yourself cool united signed an 18 year old right who's gonna become quite possibly let's say he might become the next usman dembele right he might become that next great superstar on the wing sans the injuries but he cost us 38 million pounds 38 million and we'll and we were you know playing hardball over 20 mil when it comes to Bristol Dortmund to sign in Jaden Sancho. Oh, and again, as you get, just in case you forgot, or just in case you were wondering, we didn't sign Jaden Sancho. You know that guy we've been chasing for 18 months? Chasing. You know that guy we were pursuing? You know that guy we pinned all our hopes on? You know that guy who I'm sure the Man United um, marketing team and social media team had prepared loads of graphic, um, you know, artwork pieces that they were going to promote out there, loads of pieces in terms of promo and advertising. You know that guy? We didn't get him in the end. Guess why? Because the club that we were buying in from Bruce Dortmund are run by proper football people. They told us the deadline was August, what was it, 24th. They told us if we didn't make a bid that would match their, obviously, um, asking price for Jaden Sancho, that he wasn't going to go anywhere. And guess what big clubs do? Big clubs that put, you know, put out these kind of statements, big clubs who obviously... Um, have the aspirations of becoming a great club right big clubs who are known for producing amazing talent they have their asking price you meet the asking price you get the player you don't you don't get him it's as simple as that because you know what next season there'll be a whole host of other clubs coming up lining up ready and willing to part the money in order to get his signature secured what an absolute shit show and then you make to make it even more depressing this tweet here from the account May Night HQ details exactly how little we've spent in the transfer window, considering our lackluster performance last season, especially towards the end. We got third place in Premier League, but we didn't get it by merit. We only got it because everyone else plodded around us and we literally dragged ourselves, kicking and screaming, right? Dragged ourselves with our, with our arms, right? Our legs up were completely shot, completely spent for. And we dragged ourselves, crawled ourselves over the line, over Bob Raya, over IEDs, and we just about secured first third place but it wasn't it wasn't a easy third place finish it was a very difficult third place finish and considering that the other teams that finished behind us are outspending us such as the team like Chelsea as I got here on the screen Chelsea spent 212 million net this season in order to overtake us and to you know potentially challenge for the title or to of course you know have a good run in the Champions League Aston Villa who nearly got relegated spent 85 million Leeds, who were promoted, spent 84 million. Manchester City, who finished second, spent 76. Arsenal, who finished behind us in fourth place, um, or in fifth place, fourth or fourth, I forgot where they finished, 64 million. Everton, 63 million. Everton Football Club spent 63 mil. 63. Sheffield, Sheffield United, 53. Tottenham Hotspur, 50 million. A notoriously tight Tottenham Hotspur, and Tottenham Hotspur run by Daniel Levy, who doesn't muck around. 
He's not somebody that's really loose with the purse strings, right? He he holds those things tight. Tottenham, Liverpool, forty eight, and then Manchester United. We spent we spent just a, just above what Newcastle spent at thirty five million. We spent thirty six point four mil, and we finished second by the skin of our teeth. And the other thing that people would forget as well that makes this really difficult to stomach the shocking transfer activity the fact that we're going to hand Edson Cavani the number seven shirt after all this dick teasing we've been doing with Jaden Sancho the most frustrating factor about all this is the fact that fair enough we don't want to spend too much money but we have only got a social argument in charge a manager who's basically proven to us as fans in my opinion because I don't rate him as a coach one bit but let's give him this let's give him the benefit of the doubt he has cho- he has basically he has basically illustrated or you know told us in no uncertain terms, as long as he has good players, he can he thinks he can get tune out of good players. If he doesn't have good players, he's pretty useless. He can't improve um, average players. He can't improve good players. But given a bunch of world class players, and he probably might be able to do a thing. Sprinkle a couple of youth team members in there. You um, you know um, some kids that graduate from the academy, and you'll probably be able to do a job. But he needs to be backed in order to be successful at this club. If he's not backed, he can't be successful. And the issue that I have, especially with some of the fans out there, who complain that oh we should back our manager, back Solskjaer, is that look, let's look at it this way. We're never going to get rid of the Glazers. We're never going to get rid of Edward Wood, right? The Glazers have been sucking Man United dry, you know, only taking money out, never investing their own money into the success or the pursuit of trophies in Manchester United. Edward Wood has, has kind of proceeded over failed manager after failed manager. His position is never in question. He's, he's, his job is never under threat. He's never going to rel- relinquish any kind of power or control in his position either. The director of football uh, position that we were promised would get filled has never been fulfilled. And we are there, you know, languaging um, in the past, trying to operate with this kind of really old draconian system, or not even an old system, a system that doesn't make any sense, where we send lawyers to go and secure footballing contracts of some of the most prestigious clubs in the world. Makes no sense. Now, if that's the case, and Man United board are clearly telling us that they, want, that they don't want to spend any money, that they'd rather the manager, whoever's in place, get consistently get fourth place. Similar to what Arsenal Wenger did at Arsenal towards the end. They don't want to give him any more money. They just want him to qualify for the Champions League season in, season out, keep the money coming in and keep it moving. If that's the case, get a manager who can do better with average players. Get a manager who can do better with a limited um, transfer budget. Get that sort of managing because at the moment if you try and get Ole Gunnar Solskjaer can try and ask him to construct a team or to um, uh, allow us to implement a system a style of play that can bring the best out of McTominay, Fred, Matic, Pogba, Bruno Fernandes and all these other people that play in midfield he's not going to be able to do it he's going to do what he's done consistently and just pick the best players for each position or whoever's performing the best at the time but it doesn't necessarily mean they work the best for the team so now we're just back to square one. Now we have more individuals in Edison Cavani. Does he actually benefit our team? Does he actually um, take us anywhere forward? Probably not, I'd say. For as big as a player as he is, just look at his goals. I've watched him play for Paris Saint-Germain, you know, for many, many seasons. But just watch his highlights. You'll see most of his finishes come from balls that get fred through the lines. Balls that get crossed into the box. Balls that get dinked over the top of the defense that he can run onto. So he may look like Zan Ibrahimovic in stature. He may have like that Andy Carroll physique, but he doesn't play with his back to goal. He doesn't pin defenders back and chest it and bring other midfielders in. He finishes transitions. He finishes passages of play, or he sometimes can provide assists inside the area. But most of his football comes in and around the box, running in behind, similar to what Martial does. But we don't even do that enough. Martial usually has to rely on individual moments of brilliance, whether it's from Bruno Fernandes or Pogba, getting the ball to his feet, in and around the box, and he drives in and finishes it. Or like Rashford did the other day, that Bruno Fernandes somehow got an assist for that, where he essentially picked up the ball from, you know, from the left wing, beat two men, fading to shoot, cut it on his left foot and smash it top corner, and still that was giving an assist to Bruno Fernandes. I'd say ridiculous. But that aside, we don't even play to his kind of strengths. Then on the other side, okay, let's 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 say we play him because Marshall's injured or Marshall, sorry, is suspended now for three games. Then you've got Alex Tellers playing on the left hand side, a, a very very good le- a very very good left back, super attacking, but he's gonna need help coming back. 
He can't have, he can't be just rem uh, marauding up and down the flank on his own. He's going to need Rashford or Martial or Greenwood, whoever's playing on that side, Dan James, to come back and cover him sometime when he's marauding upwards. And then he's going to cross a ball into the box to no one's ahead because we don't have enough bodies going into the area when we're attacking in that way because we play with a double pivot. And because Pogba's playing too far back and because Matic doesn't have the legs to cover the, the, the pitch in general. We have such a mismatch of players. And let's say, for instance, it goes well. We have Alex Tellers whipping in balls, getting great assists. But then we're going to be so left heavy that teams are going to figure out if they just stop our left-hand side, we're basically null and, not, null and void. Because if you switch it to um, AWB, it's over. We're not going to attack on the right-hand side whatsoever. It's not going to happen. Not in the same way that we would attack on the left-hand side. So again, it, it does kind of point to me, in my own opinion, that maybe... This is either a understanding from the club that we're too far back to try and catch up now in terms of transfers. Transfers are never going to change the fundamental issues that we have with our recruitment, that we have with our coaching staff, that we have with our mentality, and that we're just going to have to let this play out. Or the the board have recognised that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer isn't necessarily the manager to take us to the next level. Or just the manager even just to evolve this team that he's successfully put together. He can't necessarily take it to the next level. He he was very he did a, he did amazingly during that interim period, right? He was the perfect man for the job at that time. Uh, Mourinho was a tyrant. Mourinho tried to run out Martial. He tried to run out Pogba. He was uh, no, not well liked by some of the more popular figures, I say, in the changing room. He was obviously going through whatever he was going through as a coach. He probably had a bit of a weird moment where he didn't really understand. Because I can understand um, Mourinho's annoyment, uh, being annoyed at our squad, right? Imagine Mourinho coming into the Manchester United dressing room, looking around the dressing room and thinking there's not many good players here. And then those same good players who are pretty average are the ones giving him the most resistance. That can be very frustrating in the same way that it was frustrating when he went to the Real Madrid change room and they didn't really respect him that much, even though he'd won all these trophies that he'd won. <clears throat> He couldn't go in there and sort of big time them. I think the same thing happened at United. He probably went in there and thought, how the hell is Luke Shaw giving me any stick? Who's he to like not respond to my coaching techniques? Who's Paul Pogba who hasn't done nothing in, you know, three and a half seasons since he's been here. They want to give me pushback. He has to, what, he has to play only. The only way he, Paul Pogba can, can, can play to his level is if he has the perfect scenario, the perfect players in and around him in order to perform. Like, I can definitely see his, what his annoyment was. And then when you get someone like an Ole Gunnar Solskjaer coming in, who's not going to criticise the players, who's not going to go after the board, um, who's not going to... Um, who's not going to be a negative influence or unchanging ground. I see why they were so excited by him. But in terms of pure coaching ability, in terms of being able to put a team together, uh, implement a system, um, put the right combinations together over the pitch, in terms of who plays where, in what position, be able to be adaptable with his technique, with his ta with tactics, um, you know, his ability to change the game with substitutions. The only thing I can really say that he actually smashed for real was his player recruitment. But then you'd have to also say his player recruitment did also um, was responsible for vetoing the signings of Harry Maguire for 80 million and AWB for 50. So that makes you think, you know, if you're going to pin your hopes on because those two signings don't make any sense looking at it now, they both can't play out from the back. But then you want to play out from the back with those two players. Why would you sign them? Because if you're just signing, you know, if we if we were a team with a low block, and we want to just, you know, um, rebuff the attacks of the opposition side and then spring attacks when we can with just our midfield and our attack carrying the ball forward. Fair enough. You get AWB and a Maguire involved because, you know, Maguire's got a pretty big kick on him. He can head the ball pretty far too. Um, AWB is really tenacious in a tackle. Makes complete sense. But if you're playing counter-attacking football and you need those two players to set off attacks or to start the transitions or to get the balls further up to the pitch, it makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense. So he has TS takes some responsibility for the way that these guys have performed and the fact that they haven't fit in his system of play or style of play which I don't even think he necessarily has but he takes a lot of credit for obviously allowing Martial, Greenwood and Rashford to thrive to a certain extent even though Rashford has been a bit you know hot and cold um, as per lately but god almighty man this is really making me think that again because I've heard rumours as well that United are obviously looking at or have sounded out Mauricio Pochettino in terms of taking over at United and again it's a quick fix right because it's not going to fix some of our more inherent problems that we have with our team who knows Mauricio might come in and also have the same issues that Solskjaer has which let's not say may Pochettino will have the same issues that Solskjaer had every manager that's come through that those United doors post Fergie has had exact same issues right 
um, lack of support for the board, um, an over reliance on transfers to change results, and just you know short term view, no long term thinking in terms of getting us back to the top and what it actually takes in order for us to challenge for a title, challenge for a Champions League. These things are not being discussed at United. What's being discussed at United is who generates the most clicks, who gets the most shares, and who gets the most engagement. That's what necessarily goes down there. So I'm sure for the people on the board, letting go of somebody like a Jadon Sancho was unacceptable. That's why we got such a big marquee signing like Edson Cavani because he's a legacy. He's a starlet, right? He's one of those kind of, he's a Galactico in the quintessential terms of it, right? But not obviously in terms of his worldwide, not in terms of his kind of skill level, but in terms of his brand, right? Edson Cavani is a well-known striker. You know, he has that image, um, the hair, the, you know, the build, blah, blah, the goals that he scored, um, the, the teams he's been a part of. These are all things that are obviously going to um, add to the amount of engagement you get on social media, which is shocking to even say that, right? That a team as if as big as United is looking at players for their social media relevancy. But that's where we are now at the moment. So my opinion, of course, transfer windows are complete dud. We completely flopped it. Um, we didn't necessarily prepare well enough. Signing four players, any one deadline day is an indication that you're poorly prepared. You should never be doing it. Even if they're young players, you should secure the signings way ahead of time. Um, the fact that now we've only been left with an Edson Cavani and an Alex Tellers and, pres and, and presumably um, we're going to get that Facundo Pelis. Pellistrilli kid in but supposedly he's going to be starting for the under 21s or under 23s it's just a complete shocking state of affairs and the only saving grace I can say is that eventually Ole Gunnar Solskjaer will lose his job because he's not a great manager or not a great coach and we will finally get a coach in Mauricio Pochettino who has clearly demonstrated his ability to improve pretty average teams pretty average players to perform at the highest level he did it with Southampton he did it with Tottenham consistently and I'm sure he will do it with United I will just hope that if Solskjaer gets sacked Edward has to leave his post or has to relinquish some control and give it to the director of football there is no way that we can continue repeating the mistakes of before and hoping for a different outcome that is a definition of crazy and that is Stratford Red Devils talk with me Agostino <laughs> I'm joking but yeah man um <sighs> what can you do in it? Football is mad, isn't it? Football is a mad place to be in right now. And, you know, we we try our best. I think football's been one of the... What, football's want to be one of the things that's allowed me to have good sense-making abilities because there's so much stuff that happens um, at boardroom level or sometimes behind the scenes that us fans are not aware of that sort of inform decisions that we are outraged by that sometimes it does allow you to sort of like, you know, um, step back from it a little bit and not get as emotionally attached and that's where currently I am at the moment um, but it does sometimes question your love for the game when you're seeing your club getting absolutely disrespected in the world market agents laughing at you um, you know agents basically fleecing you like Edson Cavani's agent has agent and also brother has essentially got 10 million out of us which is nuts right which is obviously going to go back to the family <laughs> right so we're paying we're paying nothing for the guy we're paying his salary and we gave him 10 million sign we basically gave him a 10 million signing on bonus which is absolutely nuts uh, but hey what can we do man it is what it is moving on <laughs> let's pause that one yeah this is a this um i'm guessing most people have stopped watching videos on world star hip-hop i i assume so but i i haven't i'm still a bit of a ratchet baby in that regard and there's nothing that i like more than seeing a bunch of hood rats fighting and squabbling at a petrol station i don't know why this happens to be the spot that most hood people like to fight at i'm assuming because everyone has to go and get gas um or Maybe that's just the place to be at because most, uh, I guess if you live in some sort of um, dilapidated town or a place with, you know, not much um, prospects, there might not be a lot of shops that are open past the hour of like 11 p.m. So the only place that you can go and get a beverage, go and get a bit of liquor or just hang out, you know, whatever it may be, could be the gas station. I don't know. But uh, so for some reason, a lot of stuff seems to occur at the gas station and this fight here is none different. <laughs> we unfortunately see this young black lady. <laughs> get absolutely dragged by um some other people from the neighborhood um and unfortunately for her this is probably one of the only girl fights that you'd see where the aggressor can actually fight legitimately punching the woman in the face repeatedly and resisting the urge to pull her by the hair which i think is a very it's it's very um that's a probably an indicator of like somebody that prides himself on being able to fight 
right? And doesn't necessarily um, subscribe to the idea, oh, because I'm a girl, I, I pull hair and I scratch faces. Like, no, 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 I actually get down. I can actually throw hands. And this is a good indication of it. And unfortunately for the lady in the gold or cream or whatever you call it, katsu, she was caught slipping, caught lacking on a room at a petrol station. You know, you talk shit online or whatever it may be. And you unfortunately might get banged in real life. So let's play a bit of it now. Look at her going pink, like just going straight for the punching. Boom, boom, left, right, 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 left, right. Boom, kick to the face. Jesus Christos. And of course, a really nice car is getting absolutely dented on the side with LEDs underneath it. Her friends are coming in, they're smashing onto her. Everyone seems to have like really tight cat suits on. I wonder what that's about. Maybe that's a hood thing. Um, they're still getting banged. She's getting absolutely smashed. Ouch, ouch, ouch. That must suck too, being a girl, isn't it? Because I'd imagine it's interesting, because I'd say most dudes have obviously been in street fights, right? Most guys have been in some sort of altercation um, with a stranger or with somebody you do know um, in some way, shape or form. Because unfortunately for dudes, the kind of crescendo of arguments or debates usually um you know boils down to a fight right um i think you know girls can usually get away with start talking a lot more shit to each other because they don't necessarily have the crescendo of violence at the end it's usually just you know more so a, a reputational damage you know um uh mental warfare in that regard but with lads there's only so much shit you can talk to somebody before they say hey let's step outside so most guys have been in some kind of form of if not a physical altercation some kind of um situation that would require you to uh make sure your trousers are pulled up tight right so in that respect you've probably have come across some people that can and cannot fight right but it's usually more so along the lines of most guys can throw a couple you know overhand rights a couple uppercuts a jab or two a kick a head but someone's got something in their arsenal unfortunately for a girl i'd assume most altercations that you're in you're usually arguing with somebody right so not everybody's got good you know arguing capabilities not anybody not, not everybody's good at digging someone out so you might have the advantage there if you're really good at you know um snapping on somebody as i say in america but then imagine if you're unlucky enough to face a girl or to argue with a girl or to you know unfortunately cross paths with an op who happens to be able to know how to fight like she can legitimately fight this woman that you're fighting like legitimately she needs to actually punch maybe because she's got brothers maybe because she used to she, she you know took a group on class for flipping Tybo, whatever but she can actually fight imagine how unlucky you are as a girl if that if that happens to you because most of the time when you get an altercation or you get in some sort of physical fight with another female it just you know it always kind of results in a bit of hair pulling pushing to the ground kicking they do i think that most girls doing fights where they're like pulling each other's hair and they're kicking each other also on the floor that's about it but imagine being the unlucky one that has to you know um absorb blow after blow directly into the face right left right left right left right left from a girl that quite clearly just wants to punch you in the face and doesn't want to pull your hair and they continue here they chase her to another car she's getting absolutely tumped and then i guess her friend um tries to step in and back her up and uh, and just in case you're wondering a friend in a till um cat suit with the shorts on is the one that gets absolutely swept on the street as well. God damn it. Bang, bang. On the floor. There you go. Look at that. She's up on the floor. And that's, I think, that's usually some of the, that obviously you can see, you know, there's, there's a big moon crescent there, but this is probably the most compromising position if you're involved in a street fight, especially if you've got no martial arts training, I'd imagine, especially from watching loads of fights in the UFC, is that most of the time when you're in a street fight, you end up on the floor, it's usually just over. I think most people just assume it's done. They're gonna get, they're gonna get fucked, but in when you watch obviously professional fighters fighting, mixed martial artists, um, being on the ground is just another position. Of course, it's not as advantageous as standing up or being, you know, on top of the person yourself. But there are things that you can do to defend yourself from blows to the face. Um, so you can reverse a position, so you can submit your opponent, so you can just inflict damage and keep yourself in the fight as long as you can. But if you're in a street fight, it's, it's just a wrap for you here. And especially if there's other people jumping in as well. She's getting pulled the hair, they're punching her on the floor. God damn it, man. Epic pulls, the braids are tight, still screaming and cackling. Observation, all the girls are wearing Jordan 1s, that's interesting. 
two Jordan ones there. Air Force ones. And as she gets up, boom to the head. Boom again to the head. Boom again to the head. Holy shit, look. And you know what? As bad as it may be, because the girl's obviously, you know, dazed and confused and probably concussed, there is something honourable about being able to step up and protect your friend, even when they're getting washed like this. Because, of course, they were outnumbered, two girls, you know, against like five or whatever, all the entire gas station. But the fact that she came and she backed her girl and she got dusted, I think is quite cool. I think it depends on what you are. If you're, if maybe girls are different, but I know with boys, when, you, when you're involved in like a group fight with some, with some other group of boys, whether it's football or whatever, it's quite funny to go on that trip back home and it's all tense and someone makes the first joke when you, someone's holding their eye, someone's holding their leg, someone's got a busted lip. It's, it, it, there's a lot of humor in the fact that, you know, you, put, you got each other's back, but you all got washed. There's nothing honourable about, you know, your friend getting beaten up and you running away. But, you know, if you're able just to step up, even if you know you're going to get banged, the fact that you're going to be there for your friend and say, hey, if they're getting beaten up, I get beaten up too. There is something quite honourable about that. And I think, even though she has no idea where she is right now. Ah, damn. She's bleeding as well. So, yeah. Um, congrats to her for her friend. But I guess, you know, you, you have to make sure you don't catch yourself slipping when it comes to those altercations, especially if you're somewhere in the US, it seems like, in it? Those guys there do not mess around, mate. They don't mess around. Let's move on here. Du, 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 du. What else we got to talk about? Oh, this is quite interesting, isn't it? So this somebody shared this tweet that went viral earlier on supposedly this guy called sam the jeweler who i'm assuming is a personal jeweler uh put this tweet up it says the following about a month ago i get a facetime from a client saying he needs a flawless set but he was in prison pulled a couple of strings and here is the first 30k flawless grills on ever to prison which is insane right um so many questions right but let's just watch the video and see how these diamonds are dancing yeah nigga yeah nigga flawless nigga Look yeah, nigga, that. you see that shit, nigga, bust down big chains in here, nigga, yeah, nigga, yeah. Uh, shout out to the bitch in the stable, man, yeah, uh-huh, it's good. Yeah, nigga, thumb through this shit, nigga. Yeah, nigga. Nigga, nigga. Shit, dancing, nigga. All right, it's good. Imagine what this imagine what this young man must be involved in to be able to have the ability to pull, to get somebody from the outside, to pull some strings for him, to get diamonds grills delivered to his prison cell and you can obviously tell you know it's either he's staying in a really budget hotel or he's staying in some sort of prison so imagine what sort of clout this guy has must have in prison insane now i don't know the use of having so many jewel, jewels i don't know in prison would be i'd imagine it would be you'd be some sort of target but also imagine someone like himself can probably handle themselves they've got protection he's got a big watcher and a massive ring i'm sure this is just stuff he wears inside his jail cell to be you know to floss i'm pretty sure you're probably not allowed to wear that when you when you go and um have your lunch or you know have your break whatever they do when you're in prison but god damn it this is mad and it this is absolutely insane you don't usually what you see from pressure watching documentaries you might see like um you know uh high ranking people being able to deliver you know because i guess you if you're not allowed to have jewelry you you then you then um flex your muscle by having people from the outside deliver i don't know really uh expensive groceries right or particular branded um cooking items that you can't necessarily get in prison they can only get from the outside things that remind you of your everyday life right whether it's a chocolate bar or a brand of noodles or you know particular ingredients you used to cook whatever it may be those are the kind of things that usually you can kind of flex on people with and be like wow this guy got this all done or you get you know you have the ability to get some sort of you know private chef to come in and cook you guys a fucking five course meal whatever it may be but i've never seen something like this right some guy flossing his chains and shit it's fucking wild but it, it makes sense though because i think in some prisons they do let you buy your own trainers right and people floss that way you get people to put money in your books and you buy some really expensive trainers or some new ones every week whatever it may be so in some extent jewels is no different to a pair of diamond to a pair of trainers i'd say in that respect but i would think too trainers would be such you, you'd make yourself a target by always having a clean pair of air force ones someone's definitely going to want to you know take them off of you or make an example of you to the other inmates or something you know or kind of you know what's that word called reaffirm their authority or something on all the other inmates in that prison but yeah i thought that was nuts to see man because these are legitimate jewels that he's got um dancing on him look at that the grill is maddening isn't it you wonder what this young man's in prison for but you know 
let's just say it's not probably it's probably not credit card fraud isn't it <laughs> that's insane but then maybe as well as another opportunity to kind of hold your wealth right another way to kind of make sure that when you come out you've got some cash that you or you got some ability to kind of you know take some cash out because that's essentially you know those things will hold their value gold diamonds and all that malarkey so i'm sure you can probably pawn them or whatever it may be once you're on the outside world so maybe this is just a way this is just him kind of flexing his bank account or flexing his savings but that is pretty wild man and i like the fact that he's got a banner carver i'm thinking no one's gonna recognize him trust me if you're the only guy in prison who has a grills a diamond ring on and loads of gold chains i'm pretty sure people will have an idea of who you might be but yeah big up that guy in it and big up sam the jeweler i guess demon time ba, 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 ba. moving on we have a funny image that went viral the other day i'm not sure if this is old or from someone said it might be from 2015 i'm not too sure if that's true but somebody got a hold of pictures of um mark zuckerberg doing a baby shower um um him and his i guess um extended family decided to throw a baby shower which is you know especially during covid it's been probably one of the most annoying things to see on social media to seeing you know scores of people giving birth and deciding that their 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 experience is that much more special deserves that much more attention that they're gonna go and do a you know a gender reveal a, a lavish baby shower that makes complete no no sense and then on the flip side of things um oh no, well the consequences of um you know resulted in supposedly one of the biggest forest fires in the state of california right so you know some of the people out there can be like oh you're being a bit of a what's that thing called being a bit of a killjoy let people enjoy themselves and blah 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 all right cool but guess what these motherfuckers are essentially killing people, right? With their bloody elaborate uh, themed baby showers and gender reveals. And then you look on the other side and you look at someone like a billionaire, like flipping Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, and look at what they're doing. Now, don't get me wrong. They're probably LARPing as, you know, as what... Uh, working class people or it's just an illustration that they're very very cheap because that's also happens right the richer that you do get most if you read a lot of profiles of really really wealthy people not rich rich is probably you know you're probably going to be able you're probably going to be susceptible to flossing a bit here and there but people that have got generational wealth they tend to be some of the most tightest people around so there is an aspect of them just being super cheap and not wanting to overdo on anything or not wanting to overextend themselves in any kind of way, even when it comes to, you know, a special day, such as a baby shower, where they get the opportunity to kind of get their family and friends around. And this maybe makes me think that this might be ages ago because no one's wearing a mask, right? So this might just be pictures that have basically resurfaced on the internet. Uh, you know, there's it, there are certain images that just keep kind of regurgitating on there, like that picture, supposedly of Jason Derulo falling down the stairs um, during the Oscars or whatever, right? That's obviously not him, but they constantly kind of rotate that image around every time the Oscars come around. So this probably, could be it but this is further illustration that if somebody like mark zuckerberg can do a baby shower such as this simple back to the bare to the bones then you motherfuckers out there lighting fires um you know um having people jump out of airplanes popping big balloons uh you know having flipping dogs fight or whatever you're doing is unnecessary it's a baby people get pregnant wow amazing it's not that bloody sensational reveal your baby have people around that your your friends and family around good gathering share some drinks have some food and then keep it moving because if, if mark zuckerberg can do this you can do this now don't again don't get me wrong this is probably them just you know uh going out of their way to seem quote unquote normal because that's kind of an in thing too the wall especially with the newer reach who have you know especially people from the startup community they tend to have that whole like hoodies and jean thing to appear kind of down to earth and shit but hey if mark zuckerberg can do this you can too so stop with the lavish baby showers and gender reveals if you don't mind moving on oh we have to talk about this one this one's a big one <laughs> so as i mentioned before trump did had COVID. did trump have covid or not who knows we don't know no one knows no one has a clue um i would kind of verge on the side that he probably did have it i just don't assume if we're, if we're reading between the lines especially having read the james i bought the james comey book don't judge me but you know during the hysteria of trump in his you know first couple of years i kind of lapped up and was like oh yeah i'm gonna jump on the book as well and read it and find out more about him but essentially the book told you nothing new everything that you need to know about trump you just gotta like listen to him speak and read his tweets right that's basically his personality so 
reading between lines of what James Comey said, how he acts in public, Donald Trump himself, and obviously reading between lines about what Mary Trump said, you know, she read obviously a book, a tell-all book about the family, but you can't really take her side too seriously because she might have a vendetta, she might have an axe to grind, or she just might be a bit of a bitch in general, right? So if we read between the lines, I would say Donald Trump wouldn't go as far as trying to fake that he had COVID just because I think he's a guy that necessarily, he's a guy that kind of he's so worried about how he's he's so worried about perceiving himself as strong um as fearless as kind of like you know um headstrong fearless um you know macho whatever it is whatever you know thing that he has in his head that he wouldn't necessarily even go that far to think up this elaborate scheme so he can gain sympathy he doesn't want sympathy he doesn't really want that whatsoever. He knows you will never get it. He just wants um, the control, the power. As long as he's got the power and the influence and the attention, more so kind of like a Kanye West, he's okay. He's not really worried about having the respect of people. So I don't think this is a way to gain sympathy or, you know, to get people to be on his side. No, this was just a thing that happened. But then in a moment, as a genius marketeer as he is, he was able to twist and turn it in order to kind of suit his narrative. And what better way to suit his narrative than to get COVID? And again, most people, even myself, thought, you know what, this could be his awakening. But no, it wasn't. He doubled down his personality, discharged himself from hospital. If you believe what you read on the internet, supposedly his doctor said he didn't need to stay that long. But every other account that we have of a world leader getting COVID, they've had to quarantine for the necessary 14 days. They've been administered, the, you know, the medicines that they need and they've continued their business. But he hasn't refused to stay in his, in his, in the hospital. He's, he's, you know, they sort of kind of bent the truth a little bit about the time that he spent there when he got it that's not necessarily the important thing the important thing or the most interesting thing of it is that this guy is truly blockbuster truly truly blockbuster um tv and i don't necessarily know what most people will do especially the ones that hate him once he does get you know kicked out of office or he gets you know um or Biden ends up winning, which I don't necessarily think will happen, unfortunately. If you're American, I've, I do necessarily think, unfortunately, Trump will end up winning again. I just don't see people in America going through a pandemic deciding to change administration. It just doesn't make sense in the middle of a global pandemic. I don't necessarily think. I think most people will just be like, you know what, let's just keep him in place for now. Let things kind of, you know, blow over and then we'll, you know, um, reconvene again, you know, once his second term is over. But you just can't take your eyes off him and he then decided to put together this entire hollywood production regarding his being discharged from the hospital which is just epic to say the least isn't it epic in all the wrong ways because it sends a wrong message to everybody else out there that got covid and if anything it just lacks a bit of um what would you say not even sympathy i don't know what it is that it just lacks a bit of care it lacks a bit of regard for the public and what they're going through the fact that he's received world class of 24 hour attention for some of the best doctors and physicians available in the great state of america and then now he's suddenly trying to talk about it as if it's no big deal to everybody else which is insane but this is the video how it starts look at that just in a helicopter lands at the White House. <laughs> With the mask on. Hand raised up. And again, like, who in his team put this together? Like, this is insane the way these guys think, isn't it? Especially considering there's a global pandemic going around. Like, they still have this they're in this but again i guess there's so much at stake for them in some respects you have to understand that even if you don't like trump right he obviously if you believe the story is that he never actually wanted to be president he just stumbled in it right especially you know the fact that hillary was such a terrible candidate she didn't really inspire confidence with most people it seemed like even though you know she might have won the popular vote you know in, in general she's not very well liked it seems by some section of the american public so he kind of won by default and now that he's got the power, now that he's sat in that position, now that he's kind of shaken things up, right? And he's kind of put him, he's, he's, what's that Joe Rogan quote? Like he's given license to dickheads to be dickheads, right? That is basically the case in some respect. I think a lot of these politicians who are kind of playing nice and, you know, not playing nice, but like, you know, not being as outrightly, um, 
I wouldn't say narcissistic, but whatever that term is, outrightly, wherever they are now, Trump is giving them license to sort of flex their muscles. So they've also got a lot of riding on it because they want him to obviously to stay in power because it makes, you know, it, it kind of uh, is a prerequisite because if, if he gets kicked out of office, they're obviously going to lose their jobs too. So there's a lot of riding on it. So I understand the, the kind of reasoning as to why they would be at his bedside, you know, concocting a marketing plan, a production, uh, you know, plan, putting together, you know, storyboard, you know, how they document his return back to the White House. But this is insane propaganda material. This is, this, and this makes me laugh too, because, you know, Americans have this fixation with Russia and what Putin's doing, but this is worse than what Putin would have done. Putin would have done, like, Putin would have obviously done something similar, but this is worse. This is as bad or worse than what Putin would have done. This is insane, like legitimately insane. <laughs> like the big, you know, saying so the grand scale of the White House, him standing there on the balcony, overlooking, you know, saluting the helicopter as it lifts off, thanking them for their service, with the flag waving in the background in DC. Like maddening, man, absolutely maddening. And then, of course, he then decides to explain. Um, his experience being at the what was it Walter Reed whatever hospital that he was in, and essentially downplays <laughs> the threat of coronavirus. <laughs> Absolute nutcase. Walter Reed Medical Center, and it's really something very special. The doctors, the nurses, the first responders, and I learned so much about coronavirus. And one thing that he's not calling the China virus anymore. It's for certain. Don't let it dominate you. Don't be afraid of it. You're going to beat it. We have the best medical equipment. We have the best medicines. And again, like, f forget him as a politician. Just imagine in terms of getting over the virus and trying to get it under some sort of control. Wouldn't you just think a better way to go about it would be like, hey, I've had the virus and I can honestly say um, that even though I've had, you know, a high level high level high levels of care right high touch levels of care because i'm obviously a president they obviously got to make sure they do everything in their power to make sure nothing untoward happens to me we've set some protocols in place some standard practices across the board that are going to ensure anyone that does get into hospital at the moment will have a high percentage of surviving right or whatever it may be right so for our stat that will be a, probably the best way to go about it but you can also also say but in the meantime if you're going to go to kind of places wear a mask but don't let this rule your life that's okay right just kind of you just have to move the don't let it rule your life to the front to the end you just gotta say hey i went through this stuff wear your mask um you know keep a keep a you know two meters or whatever a distance from each other blah 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 but then also don't let it rule your life that's a, that's perfectly fine advice but to suggest that they shouldn't let it rule their lives at all so what does that mean does that mean everyone could just go out and live their lives as normal and just let the virus because it wash over as he said in the past this guy is mad bruv it's all developed recently and you're gonna beat it. I went. So again, recent. So what? If I got COVID prior, I'm I'm fucked. But if I get it from October onwards, I'm okay. <laughs> I didn't feel so good. And two days ago, I could have left. Two days ago. Two days ago, I felt great, like better than I have. Ago. Two days. Ago, I could have left. Well, weird sentence, right? This bit I didn't get when I watched it the good. first time. So and yeah. two days. What you say? And you're gonna beat it. I went. I didn't feel so good. So you said I went. I didn't feel so good. Then. And two days ago, I could have left. Two days ago. And now he said two days ago he could have left. So what? The, that doesn't make any sense, because obviously he's trying to say that I didn't I didn't feel so great. But then once I got the treatment and um, I spoke to the doctors and I rested a bit, I felt much better. I feel much better than I ever have done in the past. But you can't just you can't say I didn't feel good. Then two days I felt great. That doesn't make any sense. Two days ago I felt great, like better than I have in a long time. I said just recently better than 20 years ago what don't let it down how does that even make any sense better than 20 years ago that doesn't make any sense what because you got you got um what uh steroids injections or something how can you feel better after 20 years because you went through covid that's like brendan schaub's levels of um bro science mate dominate don't let it take over your lives don't let that happen we have the greatest country in the world but it has taken over everyone's lives, isn't it? What, 200,000 people dead or something in the United States? It's taken over people's lives. Now, again, does that mean that um, every leader should tell you to hunker down in place and not go out again and sort of like live like a hermit? No. But like I said, he could have easily said all of this and then said at the end, don't let it rule your lives, right? Start, hey, wear your mask, keep your distance, but then don't, 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 you know, let it rule your life. But this advice is just shocking. We're going back. We're going back to work. We're going to be out front. 
As your leader, I had to do that. I knew there's danger to it, but I had to do it. No, you didn't. You didn't have like you could have gone outside, but you could have just made sure you prevent yourself from touching and being in the room with random strangers and shit. And this is the interesting part of it because he's acting very similar to all these YouTube influencers, isn't it? It's the same way that they act, right? Where they get tested every single day, even when they don't have symptoms, just to ensure that they can go out and live their lives. It's sort of akin to like going raw dog on everyone that you have sexual intercourse with and then getting tested every single time. Or every time you, or every time before you have sexual intercourse raw but without protection, you make sure you get tested so you make sure you don't have anything and the other person does. But then you could just eliminate the risk by putting a condom on. I stood out front. I led. Nobody that's a leader <laughs> would not do what I did. That's a diss that Joe Biden in it, like hiding, <laughs> hiding in place. <laughs> and I know there's a risk, there's a danger, but that's okay. And now I'm better, and maybe I'm immune. I don't know. <sighs> I love when he says that stuff. Like, he always kind of, when he, whenever he wants to say something that he doesn't want to be held accountable to or held to, he'll say, I don't know. Right? He, he does that a lot. Like, he did that stuff. Maybe I'm immune. I don't know. What can I say? Maybe the Trump blood is the best blood, the greatest blood. <laughs> but don't let it dominate your lives. Get out there. Be careful. We have the best medicines. Be again, better advice in the start. If you just would have said, don't let it ruin your lives, be careful, be vigilant, put your mask on, but don't let it ruin your lives. That's all he has to say. But he doesn't. He says all that stuff beforehand that makes it seem like he's a non, what is it? He's an anti-masker and just essentially gives everyone, this is a, this is essentially going to put more batteries into the backs of all those people that have arguments in shopping centers and protests out of town halls about the mask mandate. This is just going to increase all that debate. It's not going to change. It's not going to stop anytime soon. So again, if you if you're uh, wanting to make a couple bucks, make sure you grab your smartphone, charge it, and head out to your nearest Target and record as many um, interactions as you can with mask wearers and non mask wearers because it's going to keep heating up, heating, heating up in the world and it all happened very shortly and they're all getting approved and the vaccines are coming momentarily thank you very much and what does that even mean the vaccines are coming momentarily momentarily the vaccines will be available how can the vaccines be coming i don't know it doesn't matter about the grammar anyway man this guy's a um, he's a special case isn't he an interesting special special case in that regard um what can you do if you're a if you're a citizen of the United States, you just have to throw your hands up in the air. But then I think anyone that was praying that he'd die, you know, you're a special next kind of breed of a person. But just even just from terms of optics level, oh no, just terms of common sense level, if Boris Johnson didn't die, and he's a pretty schlubby looking dude for the in the UK, he was a prime minister here for us in the UK, it was unlikely that Donald Trump was going to die. They weren't going to let that happen. So um, I guess it's good that he's back. Um, it's going to probably... Um, annoy most people but i guess most people are out there hoping that he will pass away but this guy's resilient man he's teflon that's why they call him the teflon don they don't call him teflon don for no reason man he's legitimately made out of teflon so yeah there he is next on the list we have this video of um the what, 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 what was his name what they call him the boss of his nickname right bruce springsteen sitting down with channel four talking about his essential hatred for trump and you know the how he's been acting with COVID-19 and I don't know um part of me wants to ask people who are watching the video especially if you're an American citizen what do you feel what's your feeling when you see celebrities and entertainers coming out and telling you how to vote or imploring you to register to vote or telling you what to think about your president or telling you about what to think about a certain candidate like, what does that make you feel like because I, I don't know if it was me and again, I don't agree with, you know, most of the things that Trump say anyway. And it's, I don't really have a say in it because I'm fucking British. It's not my place to say anything concerning your politics. But I would feel a little bit, um, I feel like it was a bit patronizing. Like they're taking the piss out of me. Like these people in, these, in their ivory towers, in their gated communities, um, with their 24-hour security, with their kids in private school, with their healthcare looked after, with their endless amounts of resources that they're telling me how I should vote when there might be something there might be something to be said for again i don't know nothing about american politics but i'm sure trump has probably done some things that have benefited people further down the economic ladder i'm sure he has done people in the middle class people in the working class i'm sure there are things that he's done that have benef 
benefited those group of people more so than they would benefit the people that are in a higher tax bracket or you know you know sit behind a a, a gated community somewhere they must be they must exist because i'm i'm sure there's people in america um who would deem to be working class who are not so keen on mass immigration for for just for the for the purely selfish reasons of that they don't want to they don't want to have more competition in their area of business they don't want people to come in set up businesses and essentially take away their ability to earn money and put food on the table for their families i'm pretty sure that exists there are obviously some xenophobic levels to it some racist levels to it bloody blah, blah blah some populist ideals behind it but i'm sure there are some people that just look at it in terms of economic levels and say hey i want immigration to be good under some level of control some level of restrictions uh, available some tariff sense some entry requirements blah 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 so that i can ensure that my garage that my diner survives i'm pretty sure that exists so when somebody like a you know a bruce springsteen who's w well intended you know he means best he means well he's not trying to be a dick comes out and tells you that that guy who that is allowing your business to keep on going is somehow a uh, a threat to democracy it, it, it definitely must irk you a bit it definitely must do it and especially if you're a fan of his music too right i guess it's not you know he, it's not fair for a fan of his to say hey you shouldn't be talking about politics i'm sure of it but there is a side of it where you're like it kind of will taint the music you're listening to especially if especially during these hard times right when you're going through whatever you're going through and you generally don't want any more upheaval in your country. It feels as if, if you change political parties that you're going to cause a complete amount of drama and blah, 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 blah. Or you're just voting just because, or you're not even voting. Let's say that regard, because there might be a lot of people that just won't even turn up because they just can't be bothered. There's too much, um, you know, trouble going on online and stuff on TV and stuff. It's just getting them annoyed. And then you're seeing people, you know, doing fashion shoots and runway shows. We just now saw a Louis Vuitton runway show with a t-shirt emblazoned with vote. And, you know, flipping louis vuitton a luxury fashion house based in the middle of flipping paris in the middle of france like it's got nothing to do with american politics whatsoever and they're telling you know imploring american citizens to go out there and vote it can just seem it can sense a bit um disingenuous a little bit patronizing and super annoying i would assume so but i don't know let me know if you're american um citizen what you think of it but i play um this clip here from uh channel four with bruce springsteen talking about his hatred i guess for trump and um the politics in general the trouble at the moment is is, is you have Donald Trump who is talking about rigged elections and he's not he has a feeling he's going to lose now which he, of course he is going to lose you're confident oh yeah oh yeah he's going to lose and uh, I don't think so he, mate going to be a surprise and because let's think about it right 2020 has been a shit year 2020 has been a catastrophe right catastrophe from the big from the moment um this virus escaped wuhan and crossed over many many borders and covered many many nations we've all had a pretty dire year wouldn't it just be perfect way for 2020 to end for trump to get re-elected again by a landslide wouldn't that just make complete sense just again not saying i like the guy or not not like the guy but wouldn't that make complete sense part of me just thinks that's just that's just poetic way to end the year it just it, it just makes complete sense to me now, if if uh, the other if, if Biden ends up winning, there will also be a bit of a turnout for the books. But that just seems too storybook. It just seems too romantic, too Disneyland, too Disney of an ending. The real ending is going to be like a James Cameron movie, right? Or like a what's his face, um, the guy from Inception movie, right? Or like a Quentin Tarantino movie or Martin Scorsese movie. It ends and it's not a happy ending. It's like you know, your protagonist dies someone misses an arm the child never comes back again like it's gonna be that it's not an ending from taken he doesn't end up going to find his daughter again and again and again this one the daughter never comes back he's such a flagrant <laughs> toxic narcissist that he wants to take down the entire democratic system with him if he goes if he could reflect on these things maybe he'd have uh but he's such an unreflective person and uh, <laughs> he hates he him so much. He has no sense of decency, <clears throat> no sense of responsibility about it. And the words that he's been using over the past several weeks really are an attack on the entire democratic process. And is that dangerous? Yeah, it is. I think it's very dangerous. He does have a lot of people's ear. And, uh, and again, if you're in the entertainment industry and you're saying Trump is dangerous, man, how about all these record executives that are fleecing young and aspiring musicians, essentially putting them into modern day slave deals, taking away their ability to make money, especially during COVID, right? If you're, if you're the Bruce Springsteen, you're fine. You have royalties for days. You have placements for days. Money coming in, you know, whenever. 
But if you're young and up and coming artist, to take away your masters, to get you in a 360 deal, to take away your ability to stream, you only make pennies on a dollar with the amounts of streams that you do get. That's really exploitive, right? That's really a, um, that's forget damaging a democracy. That's essentially damaging an entire generation. A kids that are being essentially con Stockholm syndrome convinced that they still need labels even to this day. But hey, uh, I don't think he's going to go quietly into the, you know, gently into the good night. I think he's going to uh, make a big a mess as he can. And uh, I don't know what that's going to mean, but we'll, we'll find out shortly. Hey, man, he's, he's free to say what he wants to say in it. But I guess for me, if, if, if I was an American citizen, I'd be annoyed hearing all these celebrities constantly telling me why I should vote or how I should vote, or how I should think about somebody. It's none of your business. You know what I mean? Just I wouldn't say sharp and dribble, but essentially, yeah. <laughs> shut up and trivial it's too much i kind of i cannot do it man but hey maybe i know something else so again so let me know in the comments below maybe i'm off in the market that way but what do you think when celebrities tell you to go out and vote a certain way let me know in the comments down below talking about voting a certain way um alex jones um trump's on and off friends i'm not sure how what their relationship is at the moment they seem to be friends one moment then they're not friends Alex Jones' relationship is similar to the relationship he has with joe rogan where Joe feeds him information, but they never really said stuff about him positively in public and distance himself and, you know, the whole drama with his episodes on Spotify and blah, 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 blah. But we're not really sure where they sort of stand. Um, but Alex Jones basically gave us a little tidbit, a little bit of news regarding um, some things regarding Trump in terms of his eating habits, which I think were common knowledge. But he then obviously um, was able to maybe emphasize this in the light of the stuff that's going on with covid and the fact of you know emphasizing trump's love for mcdonald's which made me think or fast food which made me think especially considering the collaboration with travis scott and jay balvin would mcdonald's ever dare to do a collaboration with donald trump the same way they did it with travis and jay balvin yes i know you know politically it might be a bit of a suicide uh it might be a bit of a suicide might be suicidal in the same way it was suicidal when that Goya Beans guy went and spoke at the White House one time, right? But there is something to be said if you really want to, you know, become viral. If you really want to, you know, break the internet, do a collaboration with, with um, Donald Trump. Help, like, allow him to do his favorite meal. That would be a really good way to do it because supposedly Trump eats a lot of fast food because he's afraid of getting poisoned. And Alex Jones tells us some of that now. All guilty of it. Most of us are. <laughs> that we're sitting ducks. And and Trump at 74, eating fast food. You know why he eats fast food? Look at the amount of papers these guys have. Why doesn't he have a, like, I wonder what he's fascinated with his paper. Maybe it's a tactile thing, right? Because I knew I was like that when I used to, revi when I was revising in school um offering an exam i found it a lot easier to mem to remember things when i read it down i guess there's some sort of um uh there's some sort of uh ability to remember things when your move hand is moving or you've seen it emotion i don't know what it was but whatever it was i re i definitely um held information in my head longer off of the prerequisite amount of time that i need to do the exam when i read it down so if i if i was writing an essay if i was wanting to remember a certain answer to a certain question i would actually write the answer down in several different ways in different sort of paragraphs you know take out some letters take out some words blah 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 and that's where i did it but this fascination that he has with having papers during his broadcast of his show it's just weird because he can have all that information stored on a laptop or like a tablet or something. He doesn't need to have so many bits of paper. But I guess in his side of it, I'd think if you're a conspiracy theorist, you usually print those things out because you're afraid if you don't, they're going to update the stuff on there and on the back end, change titles, change dates of uploading because you can do that sometimes with regards to websites. So you don't have a hardcore, you don't have a hard record of it. And this is probably what he does have. But imagine the amount of paper Alex Jones goes through per broadcast or per show or per day per week like bloody hell he definitely doesn't believe in global warming <laughs> that's food right they send the secret service around i was told this before it was in the news he likes it anyways but because they go to they'll, they'll go to one mcdonald's this time one burger king this time one wendy's that time he's because they don't trust these places they're not jack with his food Insane. can you imagine you know we'll just eat the white house food he doesn't trust them He's got spies all around him. It's crazy. You know, I, Sean Hannity gets his food messed with. I know my food's been messed with. That's mad. 
<laughs> just <been> now. <laughs> they don't just take your bank accounts. They don't just take your credit card processing away. They don't just deplatform you off the internet. They take your food and they put snot in it uh -huh. and boogers in it uh -huh. and they wipe their ass on it. And that's what they do <laughs> because that's what the left does is they're a bunch of cowards. They never fight up front. They have no chivalry. They have no bottom. They support pedophilia. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you see how amazing he is? He starts off with a pretty decent point. He makes some good arguments for, you know, um, uh, the abolition, you know, absorb, destroying, deplatforming, getting rid of council culture. And suddenly he starts to go into <laughs> pedoph pedophilic rings and shit. Oh, he's the best. He really is the best, isn't it? Good old Alex. You could always count on him. Next on the list, we have an update regarding some interesting developments uh, in the UK um, regarding the spread of coronavirus and who's to blame. Because, you know, effectively, we're in a position now where things aren't getting any better. Um, numbers are still spiking, uh, it seems like, for the most part. And what better way to deal with the issue than start pointing fingers, right? And we love to point a good finger in the UK. We love it. We love a good finger pointing. We love um, abolition of responsibility and we love to blame other people for our own mistakes. So naturally, Boris Johnson has now essentially turned on his own minister, right? One of his own colleagues, someone he put into place and basically said his scheme that he ran, the Eat Out Help Out Drive, may have helped to spread coronavirus, which is absolutely insane, right? Because this comes from the same person who you know told us in the beginning of summer to go out and enjoy our summer he's gonna save christmas to go and enjoy our holidays going to the pub was a patriotic duty and he's now blaming you know one of the initiatives that he was spearheading as being <laughs> the reason why covid is spreading the uk like it's just you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot or shoot yourself in the head sorry it, this is an article from bloomberg said boris johnson says eat out drive may have spread covid in the uk so, says the following, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson acknowledged that his government's summer plan to subsidise dining may have helped to spread the coronavirus. Under the Eat Out Help Out drive, the government paid up to £10 per person towards the cost of a meal in a restaurant or cafe in an attempt to kickstart the economy and encourage people to spend money again after the pandemic lockdown, which again was a great initiative. I don't think it was a bad idea. I think it was a really, really uh, clever idea, a really um, great idea for the restaurants themselves. I'm sure a lot of them made a lot of money. I'm sure a lot of them probably got a lot more hassle than what it's worth but at the time it did seem a little bit ill-timed it did seem a little bit premature because we ne we hadn't necessarily got a grip of the numbers um a lot of the scientists a lot of the virologists were saying that we were going to hit another peak another spike was going to come um there were people that were parading around beaches across the uk people were filling up her pubs and stuff we never really seen that we took the virus that seriously to be rewarded i would say with the benefit of being able to eat our help out and get half price meals on a particular day in a week it didn't seem like that made sense but again, we continued, we, we gathered on, and then guess what? Things turned around. So continue here. The surge in COVID infections since September has forced Johnson to clamp down on the hospitality sector, imposing a 10 p.m. closing time curfew and tighter rules on wearing face coverings in pubs and restaurants. So that's the irony of it, right? The same industry that he was trying to kickstart, the same industry that he was trying to give life support, right, is the same industry that he's now effectively punishing and blaming the spread of coronavirus for that industry when so far the evidence I've seen has basically stipulated or said that only 5% of cases in the UK concerning coronavirus come from the hospitality sector. Now, again, whether or not that's true or not is something, you know, to be, you know, all good another time. But just looking at it from, you know, purely, um, you know, uneducated point of view i would say most restaurants most pubs or most bars go above and beyond to make sure their places of work are covid secure because they have a lot more skin in the game they have a lot more at risk a lot more on the line if they get things wrong right imagine if you're a pub or restaurant or place of business um in the hospitality industry um ends up being a hotspot for cases they end up having like similar to that nightclub in south korea imagine that happens to you your business is gone your business is already suffering anyway due to covid right you don't have the ability to uh make a consistent living and all that sort of malarkey but imagine imagine if you end up having the unfortunate circumstance of not cleaning your places your work services down well enough and then or you don't have people taking people's temperatures or track and trace whatever it may be and you have a spike in cases of your restaurant you can't afford to you can't afford to let that happen so i would argue that just off that logic that that assumption is probably incorrect and again it might really hurt if you're an owner of a pub or restaurant that 
you have somebody telling you to reopen underneath this scheme that's essentially going to bleed your resources dry right it's going to require you to hire more staff um you're not going to make enough money i'm sure the people that were eating out helping out regularly were usually the kind of customers that restaurants don't really want to have they usually tight they usually don't like tipping they usually just order exactly what they order and leave they're usually late they usually book big tables big groups and don't call when they want to cancel all this sort of other good stuff right so they went through all that trouble all that hassle to get better life support to allow them to maybe see out the year and then bang they get hit with a curfew so he continues they said in an interview with ABC's Andrew Ma on Sunday, Johnson defended the EI Help Out program for helping protect millions of jobs in the hospitality industry, but conceded that it may have had impact on the infections. What a cunt. So he said the following. It was very important to keep these jobs going, Johnson said. Insofar as the scheme may have helped to spread the virus, then obviously we need to counteract that. Which you could have you could have guessed it from the beginning right so the lack of consultation with the hospitality industry is what caused this right they didn't want to consult they didn't want to come to some sort of um consensus that would make sense with all these establishments they just put a plan together send it out and said hey this is what we're doing and now they're turning around and blaming the same sector for the spread of coronavirus which is absolutely insane and then you continue with this on um the the, the 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 next level of finger finger pointing and blaming here is an article here from the bbc it says covid19 boris johnson says everybody got complacent over the virus everybody right now think about it right this guy's saying everybody but this is the same person that said the following back to normal by christmas preferably safe for schools to open he told us to eat out and help out and he also said it was our civic duty to go to the pub and this guy is now telling us we all got complacent. Wow. If ever there was an indication that, you know, you shouldn't ever give a shit about politics and you should just try and be a valuable member of your local community and at best get involved in local politics, this is it. Because these guys don't know what they're doing. They're incompetent to the highest degree. They are essentially blameless in whatever they do. And they are reckless with abandon with the power that they have. Absolutely insane. So the article continues here. It said Boris Johnson has suggested that the recent spike in coronavirus cases in the UK was a result of people uh, fraying, uh, fraying of people's discipline over the summer. He told us to go on holiday, remember? Um, he said that the compliance with the virus restrictions had been high at first, but then probably everybody got a bit kind of complacent and blasé. Yeah, same with Dominic Cummins. He got blasé too, right? Cases have increased sharply across the UK since the end of August. At start, uh, After starting to relax the restrictions before the summer, the government has since had to toughen up the measures. It comes as the latest UK figures show that there have been um, 6,968 cases and another 66 deaths. The unnumbered measure that shows how many other people each person with the virus infecting has risen to between 1.3 to 1.6. However, there is more evidence that new coronavirus infections may be increasing more slowly than previously. In total, there are 16.8 million. The Prime Minister, who was speaking to the BBC journalists from around the country, denied the lack of testing in Northwest has caused the virus to get out of control. Of course, it's never their fault. It's always our fault. Always, always, always our fault. One absolute cunt, man. What can you do? Moving on, we have another interesting development. <laughs> Again, they just keep pissing on us and telling us it's raining, isn't it? So, um, Rishi Sunak, right, uh, went on Sky News recently. The member of Parliament for Richmond, Chancellor of the Exchequer, he's essentially the, he's essentially, he's essentially the guy that's in charge of the checkbook in the UK. Um, went on uh, Sky News. And essentially rebuffed or kind of counteracted what Boris Johnson, his boss, said about the EI Help Out scheme, which it makes sense in it, because his boss basically threw him under the bus in public. So he said, no, it's not my fault. Right. It, um, <laughs> and he has this amazing quote while he's sitting down with Sky News where he's saying that we're coming to a simplistic conclusion, which is funny because it seems that the government's also coming to simplistic conclusions when they um, highlight or pinpoint the hospitality industry as a cause for the spread of coronavirus, right? It's super simplistic because if you look at the numbers, if you just use a bit of your common sense, it doesn't make no sense to the places where they are the most COVID secure that they'll also be the place where they're spiking the virus because by that logic, you should also close all the universities, right? You should close all the schools. You should let every student study at home remotely because um, it's been proven, especially with the numbers and cases we've had the other day with that Manchester University, over 700 students were um, have a COVID positive test that those kids in close proximity are obviously spreading the virus but it's essential that they reopen the schools because guess what 
some of these people, especially, I guess, some of the people within a Tory government have ties to certain, let's say, property development companies that are profiteering from these um, unsuspecting kids going into dorms um, when they probably shouldn't be going into dorms. So this is um, Rishi um, Sunak saying this exactly what I'm saying uh, and absorbing himself of blame and essentially telling Boris Johnson that, hey, it wasn't my fault. Um, it's a public to blame. Let's play a bit of his interview here. So to help out, a scheme that many people took advantage of, and I'll admit that I certainly did myself. But do, do you accept, as the Prime Minister did at the weekend, that Eat Out to Help Out might have contributed to the spread of COVID-19? I'm not sure that's exactly what the Prime Minister said. He said, in general, <laughs> it, as far as hospitality is a source of transmission, it's, that's why uh, we should make sure we focus. Mm, no, that quote was pretty clear. That quote I read earlier was pretty clear. He did uh, he did essentially say, possibly, as beneficial as it could have been to have reboosted the economy, it also might have had an effect on spreading it. That's what he exactly said. Our attention on it to suppress the spread of the virus, which mm -hmm. is why there are things like table service only, uh, the curfew, etc in place but i think more, more broadly if you think of uh, the the spread of the virus this time around what's happening here is is pretty much in sync with what's happening around the world in second waves whether it's france or i love when they do that there was all this other responsibility they blame the public and then they say nothing is going on here is anything different to what's going on around the world Spain, where very specifically our scientists said we were following exactly the same curve so actually there seems to be more a feature just of the virus and the season than anything specific and then on, on the scheme itself i mean if you look at where it was used uh, almost the most uh, in, 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 uh, well, in reference to the size of the population, the southwest probably stands out. And indeed, the southwest today is the region with some of the lowest COVID incidences anywhere in sure, the country. OK. Public Health, so England, I think... data. Public Health da England data also shows between the 14th of August and the 20th of September, eating out was the most commonly reported activity in the two to seven days prior to symptom onset. Correlation, perhaps not causation. But if you look at Manchester, their case numbers were 32.5 per 100,000. The week ending the 27th of September, that number was over 200 per 100,000. The week of the 2nd of October, it okay, was over nice. 500. You can't say for certain. 100 well, percent exactly the scheme didn't contribute i i, I think you, you just we were having a conversation before about data science and you said it there there's a big difference between correlation and causation so I'd he be, just said that i would be i guess cautious about jumping to simplistic conclusions there's also different data which also using public health england data uh, which hospitality industry has also analyzed and that showed uh, a very small percentage uh, of hospitality being a cause for transmissions i think one thing we know is and actually i speak to our scientists almost every sure. day it, it's incredibly difficult at a, a such a granular level to pinpoint exactly the cause of transmission so why are the clubs closed he said it seems very difficult to pinpoint where the transmission is happening so why are the clubs closed why can't people go into football stadiums people can go and protest in the middle of high park can fight police officers outside parliament square right rightly for whatever cause that they're fighting for go ahead protest do your thing but why can't people go to football stadiums why can't clubs open up with limited capacity why can't people in the entertainment industry make a living? There we go. And this moves us nicely on to the next topic of the day and something that obviously hits home for me being a, you know, a, what would I say? Uh, being a weekend DJ in that regard, in my experience, um, or from my walk of life, this is definitely going to be something that's going to impact me. So covid this is a headline from ITV said COVID. Rishi Sunak says people in all walks of life are having to adapt for employment. And of course, the headline before that was people within the arts and the entertainment will have to get another job or something along those kind of lines, right? Which has kind of been causing a bit of a stir on the whole DJ Twitter places and stuff. And people have naturally, you know, have, have a lot to say about it. And it's sobering, if not a little bit um, annoying, to say the least. And I think most people, most sensible adults out there have come to the realisation that we're going to be living with this virus for at least 18 months, right? I, I already specified at the beginning of this COVID when it spread, you can look back at some of my episodes from March. I said that this was going to last until the end of the year. I was guaranteed or sure of it. There's no way countries and economies can shut down for a prolonged period of time and then restart up 
you know, at a flick of a switch. It's going to take six months, uh, you know, at best to get things up and running where they were prior. And that's not even counting when, you know, the virus will sort of kind of, you know, wash its way through the population, as Trump would say, or that we kind of get a vaccine. So I always sort of specify that the earliest that things could get back to some level of normality would be the end of the year. Now, it seems that like we're going to head into the middle of the year, especially in the UK, but for more intents and purposes, the probably safe assumption will be 18 months from March until whenever 18 months is. So if that's the case, I think most sensible adults have come to the realization that they're probably going to have to make some adjustments, especially if they work within the entertainment industry, because we were the first sector to close or hospitality industry, we were the first sector to close due to the um, understanding that viruses, especially airborne viruses spread, um, you know, spread at best in closed environments where people are shouting perspirating and all that malarkey so naturally bars restaurants clubs and all that good stuff arenas would be the first things to close down now unfortunately i think that those places will also be the first places to or the last places to reopen once the economy does reopen that's the major issue that we have here at play so if that's the case then what rishi sunak is saying here shouldn't be that much of a surprise we shouldn't be that surprised by it whatsoever. That he's saying all people in most life should be making the depth themselves to employment. But unfortunately, it, it's not a surprise, unfortunately, but it is something that's kind of hard to swallow. It's a hard, hard pill to swallow. It definitely, definitely is. So this is the update from here. It says the following. Um, the Chancellor suggested people in all walks of life should look to find new opportunities as he declined to provide further support for struggling workers amid the continuing coronavirus crisis. Rishi Sunak said, I can't pretend that everyone can do exactly the same job as they did when they were starting at the beginning of the crisis. That's why we've put a lot of resources into trying to create new opportunities, he said, which is just like, Again, I'm, you know, I, prior to the lockdown, I was playing, you know, every other weekend in some local bars and pubs here around. So, you know, they weren't necessarily some of the most glitziest of um, gigs that I was getting, but they were fun enough. There were great opportunities, great little um, side gigs that I was doing in order to supplement my income, which just allowed me to just go out and play some great music, have a bit of a dance and have a good time. But I can only imagine what it must be like for somebody that's actually a touring DJ, somebody that essentially pays their mortgage, being able to play behind a pair of decks in some, you know, abandoned warehouse somewhere in the middle of Stuttgart and not being able to do that now must really really hurt and then having to somehow come to the realization that you're having to what tr learn how to code um retrain yourself um apply for jobs in an industry that you've not even had any idea what's going on as for as much as we've complained about the um disconnected nature that some of these big djs have right especially with some of the business techno people can you imagine those people trying to get normal jobs they have no sense of what's going on in the real world and now they're having to suddenly navigate working with the regular schmegular people out there it's no surprise that they're trying their best to play at all these play grades right because they just have no idea like i'd imagine somebody like a Amelia lens probably doesn't even have a cv right you spent most of your time being a model in your younger age and now you've suddenly um you know um turned into a world touring dj for you suddenly now to put a cv together to work an office job makes completely no sense so i can definitely sympathize for those guys and girls out there who are essentially um paying their way through life working with the same industry and now you're being told to relearn or to kind of pursue other opportunities but unfortunately the really hard pill to swallow with covid is that it's impacted everybody no one is immune from this no one is sort of um no one is unaffected by it and in some way shape or form unfortunately the lower the down the rung you are the lower down the ladder you are um especially in terms of the entertainment industry you know especially if you haven't have you don't have savings or you don't have the ability you don't have the the name that's most of it because most of these playgrounds that you're seeing now you're seeing a lot of big named artists getting booked in these places right because naturally if you're a promoter and you have limited capacity you're not going to take a chance on up and coming people right we would have liked that to happen we would have that was the assumption that we all had at the beginning of covid we all thought oh this is going to be a great opportunity for all the up and coming artists to get a chance to play it's going to um change scenes it's going to allow you know because again for myself being a raver and going to different um cities across europe there's nothing more annoying than going to a city across europe going to a random city let's say you go to flipping prague to go see someone you go to a very well-known club in prague or something and then you end up seeing the lineup and it's just the same lineup you would have seen in the middle of london right same kind of people playing the same type of music you don't see any of the local talent you don't you don't even get to hear what they're really into as a scene in general especially if you're a tourist you don't you know and you don't go to record stores when you're watch your day you just want to pop into a nightclub you don't understand you don't actually get a uh, 
and understanding what's going on in the underground, it really is a bit um, disconcerting to go somewhere and just see the same people playing, right? Craig Richards, Ricardo Villalobos, um, you know, Sven Var, blah, blah, blah. It just gets a bit annoying. So we would have all loved for COVID to have been the punt, the kick up the ass, the thing needed in order to kind of change how clubs are booked and programmed. But unfortunately, um, because of the limited capacity that some clubs have, they just can't take the risk. I understand it on their side, especially if they're continuing paying rent, especially if they're getting no government subsidies, they have to ensure the events they're putting on are selling out. And now they just don't want to guarantee it. They book the top, you know, 50 rated people out there, DJs, and they just book them. And then everyone else is left basically scrapping, right? Fighting for the scraps. And that's essentially been part of, if not the main reason why there's been so much um, vitriol and so much anger directed to some of these business techno people on social media now don't get me wrong most of them especially with some of the you know back some of the sort of posts and eulogies that went up when eric Müller died was sickening to say the least but i think most of the stuff that people have been annoyed with these guys have been mostly due to the lack of opportunities or fair opportunities being evenly spread out around the scene and it's going to be even worse now with less places open limit capacity and not enough funds in order to pay most of the people that are playing and now we have this you know especially in the uk you have rishi sunak essentially telling us hey if you're an entertainer or a dj you have to go and learn a new skill get in your occupation because your industry is completely fucked and i think most people again most sensible people probably knew this prior but it's obviously it probably is a bit disconcerting to see the government completely abandon our industry completely and just say hey you guys are on your own but it shouldn't be no surprise really i don't know tory government i never expected them to give a shit about nightlife i never expected them to give a shit about club culture i never expected them to give a shit about anything that we do in our little microcosm no matter how much money we kind of contributed to the overall uh gdp or the overall revenue of london they were never going to see that they were never going to look at that as a necessary place to kind of get given any sort of attention to it was never going to happen and continue said um when asked specifically whether some of the uk's most fabulous musicians and artists and actors should get another job the chancellor suggested that there's still work available in the creative industry like what what's available i'm assuming agencies are probably low in work management companies uh production companies are probably null and void marketing teams are probably good budgets have completely been eviscerated there's nothing like even if again it's not to say that the industries can't function um sorry the industries cannot function without the people performing right they are by they are kind of hand they go hand in hand so you can't tell people in the industry that are in front of the mic to somehow go behind the scenes but there's no scenes to go behind right i've heard of most agencies downsizing and to, if, if, they, if people want to follow they've all been let go and they've just basically got one person in the office sort of handling things so it's unlikely that they're now going to start hiring you know um superstar djs to come what and be what interns start photocopying stuff like it continues here it says um uh he said um can things happen in exactly the same way that it did no but everyone is having to find new ways to adapt and adjust to new reality not you of course uh, it continues two weeks ago mr sunak launched a winter economy plan which designed to protect the tsunami of job losses but many in the creative industry feel that they were not protected by many of the new schemes asked whether the support is for the creative workers mr sunak pointed to a fifth 1.5 billion cultural recovery program which awarded cash and struggling businesses and self-employment support scheme so basically get get unemployment and that's it he created a new job support scheme which um, replaced a furlough scheme but said only people in the viable jobs would be able to use it so again useless to us um, the further scheme, which was paid wages for more than 9 million people, finishes at the end of October and many people feel they've been unfairly left out on a new scheme. Annoying again. Much of the creative industries cannot reopen due to COVID-19 restrictions, meaning the businesses are currently unviable. Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, said the Chancellor should not be should be working to support businesses which would be viable had it not been for coronavirus. So again, just a really, really, really shitty situation all around and um, best kind of summarised by by this uh tweet that i've seen here actually from some guy called gabriel satzan who i think is a writer for resident advisor he said the following maybe the most depressing element of the uk's impending kill of all arts and music is that much of the summer was wasted on small issues and spats and again we'll come back to that term small issues because that caused a bit of an issue for him online isn't it with a certain segment of twitter so we'll come back to that and he continues now when the government rolls in with bulldozers and no one has a strategy language tools or basic energy for the fight that matters very very true he continues 
people in the music are rudderless, looking for an outlet for their grief and anger for being made obsolete. But it's hard to say that the dunking on each other, knocking on young people, going to parties, or kneecapping news outlets, an effective shield for an existential Tory threat, which is true. And it's something I've, I've said, I think, prior. Some of my um, initial kind of anger towards people going out and partying dissipated quite quickly when I realised that there was no support for the club's institutions that I know and love. Then I completely understood why some people were willing to take the risk to go out. Some people are willing to take the risk to play in order to kind of, and you're going to get, you know, pushed back online and people are going to hate you for, you know, playing a play grave. But I completely understood it from the customers and from the people that were performing. People that perform need to obviously make an income and the people that are going need a release from this constant 24 hour doom. I'm assuming no matter where you are in the world, you turn on the news and it's constant people telling you about the numbers of people that are passing away due to this virus no economic plan no insight about when things can get better right just complete in a impending doom 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 so, so if you want to go out there and rave and party during a play grave that's essentially essentially you know unfortunately going to cause more damage than good i completely understand it, especially for the people that you know are under the age of 35 and think they're invisible that makes com- invincible sorry that makes complete sense to me um continues here Willingly adopting the rhetoric effect and destructive um, tendencies, tabloids have played right into the game of divide and conquer, which is very true. The scene was completely split to the beginning. The business techno versus everybody else, um, the anti protest people, because between the protest people, the people complaining about BD just playing and not playing, people going to raves and not going to raves. It was a complete mess at the beginning. Now I think it's sort of settled down. I think everyone's realized we're all in the shit, which has been interesting because I think I remember seeing a flyer of a particular event with two NTS DJs playing an illegal party and i didn't see any backlash online about it so that's very interesting same people that were complaining about the Emily lenses and the nina kravitz going to playing play gravies had nothing to say when their friends were going to go play legal raves because guess what we're in october now people are hurting people need income it is what it is it continues here um without wanting to be too black pilled about it hard to avoid the fact that we're evidently holding a losing hand in this country sorry there's no happy conclusion it's fucked it continues it says also itv can you do one padding um do one padding this a new opportunity is in the headline it's a tactical eradication of one of the biggest industries in the country a lifeblood of millions one of only things that um they'd be still vaguely proud of as a nation craven simpering softball shit right and that's the original headline there. Um, Rishi Sunan suggests the musicians and artists should find new opportunities, but then I guess the government contacted ITV and told them to amend it, and then they amended it to this headline here. People of all walks of life, which is, you know, is, is what it is in terms of a term. But then it's interesting again to see, you know, this guy Gabriel essentially says um, the divide in the dance music scene essentially has led to us being unable to respond to the impending doom and to the lack of attention and care given to the Tory government to the our you know hospitality and nightlife industry. And then guess what happens when he uses the wrong phrase or he use or he uses the wrong wording as he used here, small issues and spats. Because I didn't think this was a big deal, and I was wondering well, why is he getting so much backlash online? And I realized oh, some people interpreted him saying small spats and whatever it may be as him saying um what was it as him saying that uh black lives matter wasn't important and i guess uh frankie from disco woman uh this woman sorry pulled him up and it said the following you know in a very uh i'd say passive aggressive term tone what exactly are you considering a small issue or spat and then he highlighted because again i didn't realize what the issue was so i guess they got the assumption some people on social media got the assumption that he was essentially saying we were worrying about small issues such as black lives matter and police brutality and not looking at the bigger picture which wasn't what he was saying he was saying that we were looking at smaller issues as infighting within our own industry and sort of pointing fingers when we should have been trying to put a plan together in order to counteract whatever the Tory government were going to do in that industry but he explains to himself better he says small issues equals members of the public reporting pubs and venues with seven people around a table that was happening a lot a lot a lot of Karen snitching in pubs and people were living in and around them which is I understand again people were scared and worried in the beginning but again you can't complain about your pub not reopening and not you being able to get a Sunday grub was it a Sunday roast when you essentially were snitching it says the following here calling the police on neighbours and park gatherings playing into the blame that neighbour tone purposely established by the Tories to cover their own failings and again you got a good headline here from the Home Secretary Priti Patel and yeah he continues um so a fairly kind of you know accurate 
kind of way to kind of explain yourself but unfortunately that wasn't enough and he still continued um saying the same thing going on and on about it trying to i, I, I guess he felt the pressure and he doesn't need to apologize for you know essentially being misunderstood you know you you say something and then somebody misunderstood what you say you don't need to apologize for it that's that's insane but he continues to say spat equals some people cheered on when the gov guardians uh news decks uh shared 100 jobs or when the critic on the bbc was tapped to be installed as the top of its structure because of existing issues of the outlets it's obstructive for two and free flow of information and change the story rule it says here from an entertainment perspective when the pandemic hit a few newsletters went around talking barely taking barely concealed delight in the mass wipeout of jobs ahead exactly right that and i can i think that one of them i think he's talking about might have been that first floor one or something as if the rebuilding job was pointless and it was deserved end of employment of hundred thousands. i found that really unsavory true and he continues and then of course frankie pipes in and says okay i think it's easy to do from your tweet that spats could mean any of the consoles again being really dismissive and kind of being a little bit rude in that respect um of the conversation that were had about race or misogyny again think about think about the issues that we're going through as a country think about the issues that we're going through as an industry or as a sector of the uk you know, you know economy and think about the underlying issues that have kind of superseded and up you know have come you know stuff that has entrenched and really need to be looked at and can't be sort of sorted out with a process or two things that nearly need some real um examination of and think about what you where you would lie in terms of your opinion of it especially if you're without an income for six months will you be really worried about these sort of issues unfortunately that's the state of affairs we're in because the government has been so blasé with dealing with corona they put up a position where no one necessarily cares about these issues that they probably should care about because they're unable to feed their kids because they're unable to pay their rent because they're unable to pay their mortgage because they're unable to travel to work because they don't have a work to go to in the first place so sometimes you know um, reducing everything to an issue of race or to an issue of power dynamics or patriarchy can be a little bit disingenuous and sort of disrespectful to the people that are just trying to go about their lives really and just trying to earn a living trying to work and trying to you know put food on the table and it continues to it says i think it's crucial to act to be accurate with what you're referring to like what just because you misunderstood what i said i don't have to be accurate about what i'm saying too and again you know unfortunately he cucked himself out and said sorry i rushed into the thread as i was fucking furious about rishi is sorry uh, going into itv and telling town industries to get another job the summer extends way 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 beyond what i've tweeted here nothing about the issue you raised are small quite the opposite of course everyone knows it's quite the opposite we had two hundred thousand people complaining about a bloody dance routine on britain's got talent of course we've got issues here in the uk regarding race we all know that it's pretty evident um most people People that are you know um of a color that isn't caucasian who drive a nice car will tell you there's issues concerning race in the uk we know there's an issue but again are we going to deal with it in tandem with dealing with covid probably not we just need to pull our resources um use our time and our resources effectively and address things that we can address at a time that we can address it and then the other things we have to unfortunately leave for another time um and yeah but basically that's the case in the matter really in that respect um, an, an unsavory end to things in general um no real solution there for the nighttime industry we're essentially fucked with last place to reopen is essentially over for most places unless they've got an ability to um make money during a lockdown i guess for yourself if you're a dj and an artist you really unfortunately you do need to look for new opportunities because the government basically telling you to go fuck yourself that's the unfortunate um, effect of covid in the uk at the moment anyway that's an hour 30 of the english show i'm going to leave it there and stop rambling and rambling thanks so much for tuning in if it's your first time of course tuning in via youtube make sure you smash like hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below if you're watching or listening more importantly via a podcast app please leave me a five star review and again share the show with your friends and all that good stuff and i'll see you guys again for another episode of the show very very soon until then take care peace